Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in our webinar today. Our topic is what have we learned from the failures in workplace tech investments? Definitely a timely topic. We have a great panel for you. Before we get started, we ask that you please let us know where you're watching us from and um, like this video so that more people can find this great content. And the presentation today will also include opportunities for engagement. There is Mentimeter, and there will be a QR code that you can use to download this and, and enter it. There will be specific questions, so we definitely want to get your feedback. Also, if you have any questions, please do put that into the chat so that the panel will be able to answer those questions. And leading us, through this um, special presentation is going to be IFMA's chairman of our global board of directors, Dean Stanberry. Dean, I think we've got an amazing topic and panel today, and I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say about this. Thank you, Kim. Yes, good morning, and thanks for joining today. Uh, as Kim mentioned, you know, the uh, topic is going to be uh, why do tech investments fail? Uh, in implementation. And that's kind of a common issue that, that many of us have seen and experienced and, and what are some of the things that we can do about it. We've got a great panel joining us today. Uh, first, we have John Wang. John is the CEO of Idea Corporation, a company that delivers trusted Internet of Things devices for the smart workplace. He also serves on the Digital Signage Advisory Group of Avixa, a leading industry organization promoting the professional AV technology applied to smart workplaces and smart buildings. Avixa is also a strategic partner of IFMA. Uh, we also now have Matt, Natalie Appleton. Natalie is the chief revenue officer of NFS technology. Uh, during her 16 years at NFS, Natalie has helped clients across North America transform their workplace technology and improve their employee experience. And last but not least, uh, Peter Costanza. I understand that he often doesn't introduce himself, so I'll take care of that. <laughs> um, Peter is a workplace technologist with ROI, a firm that helps organizations navigate FM technology. Peter has served as the director of IFMA's um, information technology community. Uh, so thank you, Peter, for serving there. Now, uh, let's see, as we also mentioned, we have um, um, uh, polls available. So if you would, please get in the QR code or uh, join Mentimeter and get into uh, joining the polls. So let's dive right in. Our first question for the panelists is, what are some common challenges and considerations when choosing and implementing workplace technology solutions and how can they be addressed effectively? John, why don't we lead off with you? Thank you, team, for that great opening and uh, introduction. Um, yeah, uh, I want to also thank all the audience uh, for being here. I definitely uh, want to share some of uh, uh, our uh, lessons learned uh, in the next few minutes uh, in re with regard to uh, investment selections of uh, workplace technology. So um, I've been you know, working in this sector for over 20 years um, with my company Idea, and we've definitely seen a lot of uh, you know great thoughts, great ideas, concepts, uh, but uh, fail because uh, they um, weren't able to choose the correct uh, technology um, for, for the implementation. And I'm not talking about specific brands. So uh, in the following, uh, I have uh, three slides here. I'm going to uh, summarize three of the most common uh, points of failures uh, that, that we have observed. So I want to start with uh, selecting the uh, technology. So I think I'll, I'll so for me, uh, my part is going to be, to be more pragmatic. I know my co-speakers are going to talk about more, uh, you know, higher level and uh, human uh, center of the uh, uh, considerations. So I'll I'll work out the um, you know the pragma pragmatic uh, technology aspect. So the first um, common mistake is choosing the uh, wrong. Um, kind of uh, technology. The technology was designed for the wrong audience. For example, uh, in um, modernizing the workplace, there is a lot of applications of digital signage, a lot of uh, screens go that goes into uh, uh, workplaces. There could be uh, large displays that make announcements, that could be small displays that sit in front of uh, meeting rooms. And very often, it's very tempting for 
uh, the uh, implementation team to go out and just take whatever they see in a Best Buy. Uh, I'm not saying they're necessarily bad, but uh, they're definitely designed not for the uh, the right audience. Meaning that most of the, the, the consumer grade devices that we find, uh, you know, commonly out there aren't really designed for 24 by 7 operation that's required for a, a workplace environment. Um, so some of the uh, uh, I'll say the fatal attraction of uh, these consumer grade devices. Uh, one is they a lot of times they they have a lower from upfront cost they sometimes they're on sale uh it's just that you know when you need a replacement they're not going to be in the store anymore right so it's, it's, it's be careful on that trade-off uh they're easy to procure uh, especially uh i mean they're right in the store especially when you have a multinational uh deployment sometimes you picking a consumer brand uh, you know they're available in most of the countries around the world and you think you you know there is your the answer to your problem um, I mean, indeed, they are uh, sometimes easier to uh, to buy than the professional grade uh, counterparts, and you know they 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 look nice, right? I mean, they're, they're friendly to the eye. Um, but on the flip side, uh, when we, we select technologies, really we need to have the right cons features for security security concerns. These are not commonly available in consumer grade devices. Uh, they might uh, incur higher. They should expect. We should expect to have higher initial costs, but it's going to pay for itself over the longer time, lifespan that they they last. So um, that's the first point uh, regarding consumer and, and enterprise grade uh, products. So maybe um, if we can flip the slide to the next one. So let me just uh, go through the next. Uh, yeah. So this, the second one is also uh, could be also a, a, a common. Uh, I wouldn't say this necessarily as a failure, but a decision that people have to make. Uh, on the left-hand side is we typically look for a, a vertical solution that, uh, has, that that's put together to solve a specific, very specific problem. Um, they're, you know, they, they're a great solution. They're fully integrated. Uh, they, they remove all the complexity um, for you. Uh, a challenge there, I mean, they're great for a specific project. But uh, if you're planning a uh, installation that's going to run for three plus years, you gotta um, look out for what you might need down the road and whether this total the vertical solution is ready for you to integrate additional options. Uh, whether you're able to, you're allowed to swap out um, and to upgrade the software to a, a more capable uh, version, whether you can swap out the hardware um, to use something that's more performant. So on the right hand side, uh, there's another angle to, to address this problem is that we sometimes uh, we often recommend clients to look at uh, the solution from a horizontal approach. So you want to pick a platform that's that's versatile to take multiple tasks uh, and it's flexible to integrate with multiple software options. So in case you need to expand on your software, you can always grow capable to uh, uh, to, to um, have the hardware replaced in case the, the hardware hits end of life. And, of, and the most uh, important, if your business grows, you want to be able to have a solution that's going to grow with you. All right, my last slide. Thank you. Um, and um, I think this is a, a less obvious point is uh, you want to make sure, because usually when you put together a solution, you have multiple parts. You have the hardware component, you have the software components, you might have multiple uh, hardware components that need to work with each other. Uh, so. Um, Sometimes we go out there and we, uh, you know, find uh, a so, uh, you know, hardware, a, a generic uh, a computer, for example, that runs this that, that runs the software that you choose. Uh, I mean, it, it, it will work out of the box, and but uh, the question is whether you're going to get support in case you hit compatibility issues uh, during the integration, um, and um, when you just pick a uh, a. a hardware software combination that's not necessarily certified, uh, no one is responsible for any problem that you hit. So what we recommend is go for uh, solutions that have, you know, that from multiple, that come from multiple vendors, but have been certified to uh, really officially work with each other and, and properly support it to ensure compatibility and performance. Uh, it's backed up by the uh, joint partnership that, that puts the solution together and uh, that uh, will align with your business uh, as you go forward. That's my uh, uh, two cents on the uh, pragmatic uh, techn uh, technical parts, but I know Natalie has a lot to share on the higher level uh, uh, business uh, aspects, human aspects, so Natalie. Perfect, thanks, John. 
And I think just to kind of build from what John was mentioning, uh, we find that having a vendor or solutions provider that has a partnership approach is really important. Um, and that partnership approach will allow for the maintenance and the growth or change throughout the organization. So as John mentioned, the you know vertical, just one task versus horizontal, which can span tasks, um, really wanting to make sure that you've got that flexibility. And the partnership approach is vastly superior because you're in it together, right? It's not just someone that you bought something from one time and you know you can kind of just move on. Um, that partnership approach is really key. In addition to that, I know we have found a lot and we do focus on the partnership approach with our clients is that a lot of our clients that were pre-COVID clients have very different needs within the solution than they did back then. And so we've been trying to evolve with and sometimes ahead of the curve to make sure that we're going to be able to support any future projects. And those future projects, I know we all hear it all the time, is really focused on the employee experience. That's at the center, at the pinnacle of everything uh, that we're finding within the workplace. And that employee experience, not just how are they experiencing that, but making sure that it's human centric. Okay, so we're people first in the office, we're people first in the workplace or remotely, and making sure that we're able to align that. The consultative approach is another thing. Um, a lot of times clients, you know, have a very focused idea of what's needed or think they know what's out there. And so by not just a partner, but having a consultative approach, you can uncover things and help them to uncover things that they may not have known about. And I know that's another really great um, component with partnering with other great organizations like obviously NFS and IDEA are partners as well. So where we're, we each have a really great offering, we can work together in a synergy to provide the client with fast options to really look a little bit further at that growth and future opportunity. And last but not least, and John said this as well, you know, making sure that they're credible. Um, so a lot of organizations and solutions we've seen, and I know John has as well, have come onto the scene in the last two years, 18 months, and that's great. It keeps us all on our toes, but wanting to make sure that you're partnering, you are doing your um, research, you know, to not just plug one hole and just kind of just have one area of a focus, but again, that horizontal approach, the partnership approach, um, and that credibility with an organization, as John mentioned, is going to be there with you. When you grow, when something changes, if something goes wrong, you know, you've got that um, credibility that you are going to be able to resolve what comes along and what changes um, are in play. So those are kind of the three big things that we definitely find. And I know Peter's got a few things to dovetail from there as well. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, next, of course. <laughs> next slide, please. So um, when I talk to people about selecting workplace technology, uh, some of this isn't rocket science. So the first two bullets are project management 101, which gets forgotten all the time. Um, I love Albert Einstein. I have a degree in physics. I'm kind of a little bit of a nerd. I like a lot of the things he said. Um, but his insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And if you even think in your personal life, you know, with your, um, we all have our uh, isms, none of us are perfect. We keep making the same problems, you know, the same mistakes. Um, but the first is conduct a thorough needs analysis. This isn't rocket science. You need to have a clear definition of what you need. And as you talk about that clear definition, particularly when you talk about technology, you're going to have users, you're going to have managers, you're going to have senior managers, you're going to have executives, you're going to have people in facilities, you're going to have people in IT. Make sure that as you're doing your needs analysis and defining what you need, you're reaching out to the different parts of your organization and looking at things holistically and how it will fit, and that will give you a much greater chance for success. The second thing, again, is, and this one is where most projects go wrong, there's not a clear project plan. And it could be, you could be lockstep and barrel as an organization with your partner vendor in terms of what's delivering and have different timelines and have all sorts of problems as a result. 
Um, we recently um, got involved, got pulled into a project to help a university that had a, a technology implementation that wasn't going too well. And I was really impressed because when I got on the phone with the director of facilities, the director of facilities said, hey, we got a problem. Can we help you? She goes, I don't want to badmouth our technology vendor. She goes, we made two mistakes. We didn't have a clear project plan and we didn't have a clear project plan. And she said, <laughs> I can't expect them to be, you know, help us be successful if we're missing these things. Um, also, as you look and you look at different technology, usually technology triggers bid minimums and you're going to have to go through some type of purchasing process. As you do that, two points, don't forget your need. I can't tell you how many times I've been involved in something going through a process and uh, what went into the sausage maker RFP machine came out asking for something else that went in. Um, and within that, um, if you could please help all of us vendors and not send us those ridiculous spreadsheets with functionality that you borrow from other people, if you're going to want to define what your needs are, Make sure you're defining your needs, not barring someone else, because it kind of gets clear as mud. IFMA is a great organization to do networking. So talk to your peers, um, ask them what they're doing. Ask if they find someone that's implemented the systems you're looking at, find someone that's implemented the class. You can get all sorts of information to help you A, make the right decision and B, implement it correctly because they can tell you where they've gone wrong. Um, and the last thing, um, particularly with software, don't do one demo. So an organization might say, hey, we need a space management system, right? And they'll get together and they'll define their needs. And then they'll run out to six vendors and get six demonstrations, which happen over a period of two to three weeks. Things are clear as mud because you can't remember what vendor A had versus what vendor C had. So as you go through your process, um, you want to go back and make sure you're taking a second and third and potentially fourth look at what you're you're looking for um, and within that you also want to make sure that the vendor is showing them their weaknesses vendors will always show their strengths so one of the things we do at roi is we help organizations select technology and when we have different software providers that people are taking a look at we have a time script and the reason for the time script isn't for the time it's so that you can't gloss over the stuff that you're not as good at and it's okay things all have weaknesses that's why they're all different solutions so just a couple practical pieces of advice awesome. okay well our panelists have made some really good points um i'd like to add this actually plays off of peter's first point and that i tend to start with documenting functional requirements before looking at products or drafting RFPs. Uh, if the organization does not have much operations technology or OT experience, they may want to engage an independent consultant to review their operations and current technologies to affirm that its scope of functional requirements is appropriate for its needs. Now, Peter and I wrote our stuff separately. So did you get the, the fact that we both talked about needs there? Um, I would also perform an organizational readiness assessment, determine if the leadership and the staff are prepared to transition and adopt the new technology. So those two steps will you know, increase the likelihood of a successful deployment and integration. Um, I have never seen one of these projects fail because of technology, it's the organization. And Peter Drucker famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> so you may have a good strategy, but if you don't understand your, your culture, uh, then you're doomed to failure. So now we have a poll. Uh, we want to ask which of the following factors do you believe contribute to any challenges or failures in your organization's workplace technology investments? So we've got five uh, po possible options here. Inadequate planning and research, lack of a clearly, uh, clearly defined goals and objectives, insufficient training and support for staff, resistance to change uh, within the organization or other, uh, please specify. And I think other should have been all of the above, but uh, we'll go with what's on the screen. So please, uh, yep, we're starting to get some responses coming in here. Um, and I think- uh, Oh, we got all of the above. We did get, get it all of the above. So great. Uh, so far we've got uh, 
all of the above is kind of taking the lead, followed by a lack of clearly defined goals and objectives. So pretty close. Um, we'll give it to taking bets. <laughs> I was just going to maybe remind the audience that if you scan the QR code, if you didn't get a chance to do it before, that's where this uh, poll will pop. And that way you can give us your feedback just on the lower right hand corner. OK. We'll give it just a few more seconds here to see who else we get. Um, but it looks like the uh, all of the above. So basically inadequate planning, lack of defined goals insufficient training and support and resistance to change um, is kind of our clear winner. Um, and then the, the others uh, kind of are evenly split there. Although inadequate planning and research uh, got zero votes, but um, um, I would also say that that is a, uh, a factor. Okay, moving on to our next question. Have how have companies adopted their workplace technology investment strategies in response to past failures and what lessons have been learned to avoid similar pitfalls in the future? And for this one, uh, we're going to start off with Peter. So you get to be the last and the first. <laughs> so one of the taglines we have here is that workplace technology solutions should optimize your operations and reduce your costs. It, if there's no ROI, there shouldn't be any project. And uh, back to a point that Natalie and John both made earlier about the industry, there are billions of dollars with a B being invested in workplace technology right now. Not only because are we having more capabilities because of workplace technology, but all sorts of organizations are betting on the digital twin. And players that weren't in FM are in FM now. So here's my iPhone, which cost me $1,000. Part of the reason it cost me $1,000 is there's LiDAR built in this so I can do indoor navigation. It just isn't there yet. Um, so as you think about technology, that goes to my second point, you want to think long term. So we've got our solution. Uh, where does it fit with a one-year plan? Where does it fit with a three-year plan? Where does it fit with a five-year plan? Um, and as you look at within that, um, not only are you going to want to gauge the technology, but you're going to want to gauge the vendor. Um, so uh, Verdantix covers a lot of workplace technology and um, they've got a green quadrant. One of the things they score vendors in there, they have the two things. It's a capability and it's momentum. And one of the reasons why I mentioned this is more money is invested in whatever this smart building or digital twin is. Uh, I think different players are going to shake out so, and different strategies. So you're going to want to make sure whoever you partner with kind of has a vision of where you're looking to go. Also within that, you're going to want to make sure you plan for expansion. So you might be implementing technology stack A, which is good and perfect, but the organization has technology stacks B through Z. And you'll want to look at how that interplays. Um, the most best advice I can give people is do a pilot. And then after that is do a pilot. And my next thing is why don't you do a pilot? So as we look at two things, um, so we're idea they sell hardware. People want to touch the hardware. You can't see it, right? You're gonna wanna interact with it and make sure that it works with your software. Um, software for facilities is usually sold over per square foot, or on some number of concurrent users. So if you're looking at a big implementation, you don't need to jump all at once. You can do one facility or a portion of your facility and make sure where it works. Um, and two use cases where I can talk about a, a pilot would have helped. So 20 years ago, I implemented a maintenance management solution at a um, Native American tribe. They wanted something cutting edge, had lots of money, and they got mobile devices for all their craftspeople. At that time, you couldn't go buy a Samsung device or an iPad, okay? So there's a company called Symbol Technologies out on Long Island that um, had these bricks. It was literally like twice the size of a phone, okay? And it was five pound drop to concrete. The devices cost $5,000 each. 
So this organization decided that not only were they have a cutting edge system, they're going to have the craftspeople out in the fields with the devices. The craftspeople refused to use the devices because they didn't like them. And as a result, the organization had a bunch of $5,000 paperweights. Had they done a pilot, would have gone by that. Um, an example of a successful pilot, uh, we work with one of the Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations. I can't mention what state, but recently we did a pilot with them with um, room booking panels from IDEA and some occupancy sensors from an organization called Free Space. And what was interesting in the pilot was um, in, in both cases, they moved forward. Um, in both cases, though, they realized some different use cases for things so they could quantify. And in both cases, they were better able to quantify what the ROI was and then the internal value and have a better plan for rollout. And as a result, things were much more successful. Um, so I hope this is helpful, uh, learning for some things we've seen that have worked and not. But again, if I can encourage you for anything, do a pilot. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I can't agree more on the pilot, you know, being so critical. Um, what we have found with in our space um, is that I would say nine out of 10 organizations that we are talking to and working through their needs analysis and, and their requirements and all of those great fun things um, are doing a pilot. And we encourage the pilot because it helps us to not only provide them with better service, you know, they've got true ROI, which is great, but also identify if there are spaces where we aren't going to be proficient. And I've always taken the line, and I think this does definitely align with NFS's partnership approach, that we'd rather know we're not the best fit then try and force the fit, right? So that pilot is um, that time period where hopefully everything's glorious, right? And, and they move forward and everything else. But where it's not, we find that it's so valuable for both organizations to kind of just take that, you know, feedback and need to reassess and pivot accordingly. And it's so funny because when we don't have a pilot, when a project moves forward, we're like, should we be nervous? Like, was there a reason? <laughs> and oftentimes the reason is resources, you know, well, who's going to do it? Who's going to test it? Who's going to own it um, from the client side or even timing. And that makes us even more nervous when they're like, well, we needed it yesterday. And we're like, well, we'll do our best. But, um, you know, that pilot validation is so true. And so, um, so welcomed, even, you know, from the more vendor partner perspective, because then we both know what we're getting into. And that pilot does also help to align uh, the stakeholders and engaging with those stakeholders. And that is definitely something we've seen um, just really branch out in the last couple of years with projects is not just that there are stakeholders, but the number of stakeholders and the different departments and layers of stakeholders. So as a technology solutions provider, we historically have always worked a lot with IT teams and project management teams and such. But now we're finding that again, workplace technology isn't just siloed. It's enterprise wide. And so we have so many stakeholders we need to engage with, which include HR, which include um, some other um, facilities, reception, IT security, of course, too, as a software solution, you know, we got to get all of those uh, check boxes checked off the list. And so, again, the stakeholder engagement is just so key to get the buy in. Now, what I will say is that these projects do take a little bit longer than they did pre-COVID with the number of stakeholders. But again, we are finding that by engaging on these different levels with different layers, with stakeholders, with different priorities, um, we're pulling all that together to engage in a pilot, as Peter mentioned, which we find to be a really critical um, and sometimes pivotal point in the project, you know, pre we're proceeding um, and that with the stakeholders and then um, the pilot gives us data, right? So data and information, just as Peter mentioned, you know, they would have found out really quickly, they weren't gonna use these five pound bricks, you know, um, if they had just tried it out. So trying it out, it's giving that data feedback in order to make the best decision for the organization. And again, as Peter mentioned, I know John did as well, in the short term, what's the immediate need? and in the long-term partner approach. So that way we've got the ability to span 
longer um, and more dynamically. And in again, an enterprise solution, um, that's everybody, right? Everybody's in the enterprise. So when we're talking about something that everybody's using, everybody's gonna need, we need to make sure we're thinking about all the different needs and layers. We're testing it out before we actually all charge to, you know, want to go into implementation because that's when you start to get a lot more people involved and we want to not be so surprised. You know, we don't want to be surprised that, oh, we thought this, but it was that. Um, that pilot really does shake those things out. And again, we always hope for it to be a fit, but if it's not, that's acceptable as well because we'd much rather have that positive experience, even if it's not a long-term partner engagement, um, than to, you know, find down the road that we've just kind of got to, you know, take a different approach and so many other people, time, energy, um, money has been invested. So those are the big things, again, stakeholder engagement, having the data from the pilot in order to, um, you know, focus on making that better decision. Great. So I'll follow up with a few uh, uh, true lessons learned uh, from uh, some of the failures that we've seen in the field. and. Uh, you know, the extent, um, and hopefully these will convince you to uh, follow what Natalie and Peter said, uh, you know, test before you uh, really deploy. Um, so we, um, in, actually, this was within the five, past five years, we actually had a, uh, a real client. It's a, uh, actually a multinational, pretty high profile uh, organization that you think wouldn't make this type of m mistake. Uh, but they, um, somehow just went in and decided that they need the you know ipads in front of every one of their five thousand meeting rooms um we, we weren't there in the early phase with that you know deployment because we we weren't that, that the vendor so we, i didn't really know if they went through a thorough uh poc uh like we all discussed but uh uh, what we uh, later learned to know which was uh, good for us is that after about a year they started seeing lots of lots of failures in the field uh, from these devices, uh, and you wouldn't think uh, you know such a, a catastrophic failure would come out from a um, a, a device that uh, you know that, that sells by the millions or maybe even more uh, out there. You know the uh, Apple uh, iPad. I'm not saying they're bad. I mean iPads are great. I have a couple of you know uh, of them, um, but uh, they aren't designed for 24/7. That was the key thing that we learned. Um, so what really happened is that um, if you plug in that USB, well, that, that lightning cable uh, and charge your iPad 24 by seven, after six months, um, there's a chance that a third of them are going to fail. And the way they fail is quite uh, uh, disastrous. Um, the, the device actually swells because the battery gets overcharged and then the screen starts cracking. So it's not a pretty sight. Um, so when that happens, uh, the client uh, immediately called for help, uh, you know, look, looking around the vendor, seeing you know, who has a better product that can replace an iPad. Um, and we were luckily uh, chosen. We uh, did a few uh, countries uh, with the client and quickly proven that you know, our device uh, is designed you know, to, to be operated that way with the proper cabling. I mean, when you mount a, dev a consumer device like an iPad, uh, the first thing you got to think about is how do you fix that slippery thing on the wall? Because uh, it's really designed to be slippery. It's not designed to be fixed in one place. Um, and also, uh, there's we, we deploy um, you know our panels in a lot of uh, universities, and they always worry about vandalism, uh, people, and also stealing uh, these co uh, valuable consumer uh, uh, collectibles. Um, so. Um, what what we, what we think here is uh, really we need to uh, differentiate my first uh, point at the opening uh, what a consumer device is designed to do which they do perfectly well and what uh, a uh, well i say a, a, a commercial grade or a business grade device is really designed to do uh, and uh, speak to your vendor about it and make sure that uh, the device is covered with the right type of uh, service uh, agreements service levels with the uh, the the right type of uh, device warranties that's going to guarantee that if a failure like this happens uh, you're fully covered number two is also uh with a uh you know large organization uh and uh they uh, they had a first generation of deployments uh they knew their needs uh they did deploy on on a wide scale um 
And now they've come to a point where they need to um, get more functionality out of the same hardware investment that they were doing, that, that, that they put in. Um, so uh, I could, you know, for example, um, you could have a, a meeting room scheduling panels that simply show the schedule of the day. So people know uh, when they can use the room, no one else is booked, uh, and when they should not use the room because uh, meetings are coming up. Uh, but increasingly, they wanted to have uh, functionality. For example, they wanted to tie in air quality uh, information to display on the wall, especially during COVID times, to make sure to ensure the employees that the uh, the sanitation, um, the the health, uh, the hy hygiene of the workplace is properly taken care of, that the air is being uh, properly filtered uh, on a regular basis. Um, so they the previous software didn't have that feature. They wanted to upgrade, uh, and luckily, um, you know, uh, we, we provided them a platform that's generic enough. So basically, you could think of our device as a simple browser. So anything that you could feed to a browser will run our device. So uh, the the client had lots of uh, choices from software vendors that simply output a URL, like the one that you put in your browser, and then have the software rendered uh, displayed in front of the meeting room. So basically, I think. Most of the, the vendors, I'm sure NFS included, uh, gives you that capability to uh, uh, display uh, the software you know, as a simple web page. And our device would, would support anything that, that, uh, that, that provides that, that output. So um, in the end, the customer was happy. They were able to uh, upgrade the software without having to uh, buy new hardware, uh, you know, thinking about you know, the scale of the deployment. Uh, they really saved a lot of money by looking ahead and look at uh, the device as a platform rather than a vertical solution that's just designed for one purpose. Really, that platform allowed them to grow without throwing out the previous investment. I think the third point, uh, Peter and Natalie mentioned multiple times, do a POC, do a POC, and do a POC. Uh, but we're looking at this from uh, different uh, angles because, uh, we, we, for example, we also have a few uh, desk devices that has sensors in them. Uh, and, um, you know, you could think about, you could imagine a client that just look at the device, test a couple of desks and feel happy about it and want to do a full scale deployment. Uh, we, we had one client that uh, decided to do that and they purchased, uh, I think, close to a thousand of these devices for, for their office um, to put on every single desk. And what I found out later is that some of the uh, sensors were um, susceptible to um, uh, influence from, from well, uh, to, to be uh, impacted by sunlight. If you have a, a PIR sensor, a infrared sensor that sits, uh, you know, close to a window, sometimes you get false readings. Many times you get false reading because the sunlight uh, has uh, infrared and that's going to interfere with the sensor. So obviously for uh, desks around the, the windows, you needed a different technology than the one they procured. Um, and they would have found out if they had a clear understanding of the scope and the, the definition of uh, the scenarios they needed um, um, for the deployment. But luckily, they only purchased a thousand. I mean, they could have done, done with 10,000. That would have been a much bigger uh, failure. So um, again, you know, I want to uh, reiterate and emphasize the importance of uh, doing POCs and also have a clear definition of what you want to uh, get from the POCs, uh, the ROI indices, the environment you want this to work in, the different types of uh, spaces, the different types of locations you want this to work in, um, and make sure you're fully tested uh, before you go into full scale. That's a my two cents. Oh. Actually, real quick, John, I, know, um, I was just on your point number one with the devices and the batteries. I was just at a conference yesterday, and one of our a law firm clients based in California said they had all these beautiful Samsung tablets, and the batteries swelled, and now they were worried about yep. the fire. And so I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, not only are they not working, and is that failing? Like, that's dangerously failing. So Please pass them my card. No, oh, oh, we're talking after <laughs> no, this. Don't worry about it. No, yes, I actually did. But I'm I just, just wanted to say how real, you okay. know, not just real no, it is, but even how timely, where you think all a the time. super great product is no. going to work, and it's just not. It's just not what it's been designed for. So, I, again, sorry, continue. Sorry. No. Yeah, thank you. The, those are all great answers. Uh, we'll have a poll here. So 
But uh, I just wanted to add, so John P. Cotter is a famous uh, thought leader on business leadership and change. And in 1995, he wrote a Harvard Business Review article titled Leading Change, Why Transformation Efforts Fail. In it, he articulates eight errors that can lead to failure of a transformation effort. Now, the panelists have touched on many of these, but a critical point is that a mistake in any one of them can lead to a failure. Most technology deployments are far more disruptive than simply update, you know, applying an update to Google Chrome. Uh, they fundamentally require organizational culture change and shifts to ingrained habits and behaviors. So change leadership and change management really demands patience, persistence, and consistency. Most transformational change efforts take many months or years to actually achieve their target objectives. So going back to having a plan, uh, those are the kind of things that you need to incorporate in, into that plan. So let's get into our second poll here. Uh, this is how does your organization measure the success of a work of its workplace technology investments? So we have um, uh, response options for increased productivity and efficiency, improved collaboration and communication, enhanced employee satisfaction and engagement, reduced costs and increased profitability, and then the ever popular other. So let's see what kind of responses we're going to get here from the poll. It's like a three-way tie so far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We forgot right, to bad. bet again. Darn it. <laughs> we have the trifecta. Let's see if we're going to get any other responses that will change that. Hey. Okay. No, still. Uh, okay. Now we, now we got a new contender coming yeah. in. Still kind of evenly split. Um, improved collaboration and communication. Yeah you know, edged up just a little bit. Um, yep. They're getting back more into yeah. that. So, um, increased productivity and efficiency seems to be, uh, have a slight lead. So it looks like, you know, most organizations have some different ways of, I guess, measuring the success, what's important to them. And again, that's, that's where you really need to start. What is important to you? But how are you going to know when it's done? And uh, that that's really uh, a lot of organizations um, don't spend enough time looking at how are we going to measure this? Um, so that's really a, a, you know, a key item. So I think about that as we go forward. Yeah. So, sorry, Dean. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Natalie. I have a comment as well. Go for it, though. Okay, so I was just going to say that uh, lately we've seen a lot of initiatives uh, around uh, meeting ESG goals. I mean, I, that, that could tie into maybe here the reduced uh, cost uh, in terms of energy costs, but I think it could be larger than that. So I'm curious that uh, that didn't come up in, the, in others. Uh, but uh, definitely, I think a lot of companies are looking for ways to uh, detect, uh, automate the space in order to conserve energy, reduce waste, et cetera. Yeah, I was going to say, I was just going to add that I think each one of these are equally important. And I almost feel like it's in the eye of the beholder, the stakeholder, mm -hmm. right? So um, depending on the stakeholder who's in the project, they're focused on one of these outputs or maybe two. But I feel like, you know, they're all um, they're all heavy metrics to hit, you know, to be able to um, really validate the success of the investment. But I feel like, you know, and as it's showing us very much almost equally important. So, yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're doing well on time here, uh, but now we're gonna move into the Q&A section. Uh, so um, for our producers backstage, uh, do we have any questions that uh, you can put up on the screen here that we can throw over to our panelists? Okay, we have one. How do you approach pilots on large scale projects? Multi room with multi applications and varying technologies. Um, Peter, this sounds something that you might have some opinions on. Do you, what, do you want to take a shot at this one? Large scale pilots? Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so um, as you look at, um, and I'm just looking at the question, multi-rooms and multiple applications, and then this can even get comp more complicated because you might have a pilot at multi multiple sites. Um, one of the things you know that I look for within that is to make sure that the technology all works together. And within that pilot that you're getting the installation and or implementation process down as you're, you're kind of going through those approaches. Um, if you go slowly, the executives aren't happy. However, you have less of a tendency to mess up. Um, so my thought is if you would multiple room with multiple applications, I might try one device, one application first. Um, in a couple rooms, or I take the approach of uh, one location with the multiple technologies in one room to make sure it works, whichever's best. I need to see what you were looking at to tell you which to approach first. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I was going to say for us to, um, we try and get a good blend um, when we're doing a pilot or POC. So not just what the HQ does or just what one of the smaller offices does or a specific region. We try and um, gather, you know, a diverse set of requirements. So that way, again, as an enterprise um, offering, we can make sure we're going to be able to check those differences between um, different types of spaces, different applications, different stakeholders and technology. So, you know, throw it all in the bucket so that way we can test it all out. I will also um, add, um, be specific about what you're looking for from the technology. For example, uh, in the case where I mentioned the desk sensors, there's a lot of uh, um, clients asking for a sensor at the desk now. And a lot of times they're just looking at the technology, for example, comparing how fast uh, it can detect when a person is at the desk or not. So um, there was, it's almost like a speed race. You have multiple vendors say, you know, one vendor is saying, I could tell uh, if a person has been sitting there for the past 15 minutes. And the next says, I could tell if it's been there for five minutes. And the next says, I could do it within a minute. Uh, <laughs> the point is, uh, do you, you know, what kind of resolution do you actually need? Do you, if you only need to know whether the desk is is, is occupied uh, for, uh, for example, for a half day of work, and a lot of organization now is scheduling uh, desk usage by, you know, by by the by a half hour, maybe by the hour. You don't really need to spend the money to get sensors that could tell you by the minute. Uh, and a lot of times with sensors, is it comes with a lot of uh, signal noises. If you have a sensor that tells you a signal every minute, chances are it's going to be very bumpy. And then in the end, you got it because sensors are are, in, are inaccurate uh, by nature. But that's the way the technology works. So in the, in the end, you need to filter out all that garbage and find the answers you're looking for. So why don't you just go for a technology that actually was designed to do what you wanted? That's, that's my two cents. Okay, what uh, do we have another question queued up for the panelists? Okay, tech is fast, a uh, fast moving sector with CFO and other uh, and few gatekeepers. How can you create an environment or sandbox to encourage low cost testing and dabbling, good technical term there, uh, with organizations that could potentially drive business ideas and strategies. Uh, so what I'm getting from this is, you know, how do you how do you basically create that sort of testing and uh, proof of concept environment uh, where you can get in, do this, do it quickly, and and uh, and get out. Yeah, I'm happy to take that um, if that's okay with everybody. So. Um, one of the things that we offer with pilots and POCs is kind of two options and some jump straight to the second and some just totally appreciate the first. And the first is what we call, um, and I'd like the term sandbox as we call it a sandbox. It's a generic system. Um, it's not necessarily specifically configured and set up for the client testing, but it's enough to kind of get them, um, the ability to kind of see look, feel, touch, workflows, approach, alerts, and it's generic. So there's no lift from the client side. We don't need them to give us any data. We don't need to give them us anything at all other than just, you know, who are the users and what's the timeline. And we found that to be really great because, again, it's, it's a no cost. It's not just a low cost. It's a no cost um, other than a little bit of time. And the second option is our more custom POC or pilot, which is specifically set up for the client. Um, 
And those are the ones that, you know, have maybe the time or the resource to be able to dig in a little bit further. And we'll even find that some will do the generic and kind of say, okay, we're still smiling and nodding. Now let's go to the one that is more specific to us. And then ideally that um, specific pilot or POC ends up building into their live project and product. So we don't lose anything along the way. It's really just a matter of what resources do they have? What is their approach? Do they want to do a low cost, no cost, generic, perfect? We can do that. And if they choose to build into a more customized scenario, we're happy to offer that too. But again, still gives them that testing ability. Um, does drive the ideas, the strategy. How do they want to use it? They thought they were going to do it this way, but now that they've gotten their hands on it, maybe they're going to adjust some things. It's a really great learning experience there. Okay, John, you got anything to add? Yeah, I'll say uh, speak to your vendor because sometimes they offer uh, maybe a, a, a discounted program for a, uh, I might be having a connectivity problems here. Okay, Peter? Okay, I was, no. No, you're back now, John. You can, if you okay. want. Okay, I was just gonna say some vendors uh, offer uh, discounted programs for pilots. Uh, so we really encourage you to do it, try it before you uh, run. Ask, just ask about the programs, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you think just high level about technology investments, I don't know the size of everyone on here. Usually it's a sizable investment. Um, so you'll find that approaching technology vendors about a pilot is less difficult than you think it is mm -hmm. because it's often asked for anyways. Um, and that makes life a little easier. So um, one of the things we do is uh, space management here. And everyone we talk to about space management, I've got to show them space management in their floor plan. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about pilots, as you look at things um, during the uh, evaluation process from the vendor side, or the, uh, sorry, from the client side or the sales process from the vendor side, whether or not you're completely aware of it, there are parts of a pilot being laid up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'll just add one point. Never do a pilot project on the production systems that you run your business on. <laughs> yeah. There will be glitches and mistakes. And so uh, if you don't want your pilot project to take down part of your business, that's not a good look. It's true. <laughs> I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any another question out there? We got a got a couple of minutes left. Uh, talk a bit more about ROI, uh, clients role and vendor role. Well, that sounds like it is right up your alley, Peter. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was actually going to touch on this. So one of my close personal friends is a supply chain manager for a large paper company. And um, we got to talking about things one night and I'm asking him, hey, Colin, and he's a phenomenal negotiator. How much do you beat up your vendors? And he said, well, my strategic vendors, I sit down with every six months. Mm -hmm. And we talk about market impact and what's happening. And they're kind of a little bit more driven. Paper's a little different, right? The costs will go and go. But his point was he regularly talks to his vendor about putting it together. As you put together an ROI, be wary. The vendor will usually have some type of calculator built in a spreadsheet that no matter how you plug in the numbers, it's going to show you an ROI. <laughs> Um, so usually when I do ROIs with people, I will take some practical things and some hard things and some soft things. As we think about ROI and technology investments in facilities and back to uh, we had lots of the um, split answers to the last question, buildings are incredibly inefficient. So if you can come in with technology and help you be more efficient, you can hit the bottom line right away by saving money. You can um, hit your help your corporation's ESG goals, right? And you can create a healthier, happier place for people to work. 
Um, uh, so there are uh, just different angles to look at it. And the other thing I, you know, suggest back to the ROI when I said, hey, reach out, and talk to other people. IFMA is a great organization. People are happy to share. Ask other organizations how they quantify things as well. And you'll come up with a good list. Anyone else want to weigh in there? Um, I think what we find a lot is um, is also wanting to look at KPIs, you know, so not just ROI, but what, you know, what are the things that are indicating that we're going down the right path, that this is becoming successful. Um, adoptions one, and I know the different options that we had listed in the last poll are all great ways, you know, to validate those KPIs and kind of see how people are feeling. Um, and sometimes it is, you know, a poll, a survey, a questionnaire, you know, just to get a temperature read to then assess the feedback and data you're got, you've received. And now what do we need to do next? You know, are we on the right track? Do we need to pivot a little bit? Um, do we need to rethink about it all together? So I think um, in addition to the ROI, that KPIs, you know, are pretty important as well. Okay. We're, uh, we're running uh, close to the time here. So just to do some closing, you know, we've been discussing the opportunities and pitfalls of technology deployments. However, these projects are ultimately about managing data. In many ways, software is simply a mechanism attempting to collect data that is complete, accurate, and timely. And that's what you really want. So data is the new currency. Uh, we tend to think about assets as physical things like buildings and chillers and vehicles, but data is also an asset, it's just a virtual one. We, uh, when thinking about your system requirements, be sure to include the standards that you will apply and the repeatable processes and procedures required to make it all work. No system can help you make good decisions with bad data and no system can overcome poor business processes. Since humans are involved, mistakes will be made. So it's those policy standards and procedures that help minimize and catch those mistakes. So just to summarize in, you know, what, uh, what we've heard from our panelists is uh, understand your needs, make sure they're documented, um, make sure you have a plan, uh, do that pilot, you know, collect your data. And I'm sure every, everyone would be willing to talk about this. We could, we could go on uh, all day. So uh, I think there's some other questions. We'll probably put those, uh, some answers together and put those out with the, uh, the summary. And out of respect for people's time, um, if we want to, we've got probably just a few seconds left here. Anybody want to also offer any closing thoughts? I just want to uh, invite everyone who enjoyed this session to join us uh, at the uh, If My World, World Workplace. We have a dedicated session talking about this specific uh, topic area. So join us and meet us in person. We'll be happy to chat. The key yes, on the screen. please come to World Workplace, my home yeah. city, Denver, Colorado. So I'm actually get to be chairman and in my hometown. That has only happened yes. one other time that we're aware of. So um, just serendipity. All right. Well, if uh, no other questions, we will uh, close the, the session for now. Thank you all for attending today. We appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.